I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us this this morning. Um, I'm really excited to share with you, you know, some of the uh, experiences and and uh, working uh, inside of Mammoth Cave that I've been able to do in the last couple of years here. And certainly working with folks like George Crothers has been uh, a, a great opportunity as well. I really uh, enjoyed working inside of the cave. So let's get started. So Mammoth Cave is basically a park on two levels. There are 52,830 acres of reclaimed hardwood forests and winding riverways, and below it, the longest known cave system in the world. Currently, this cave is surveyed at 420 miles of passages. It's located within a day's drive of major population centers offering camping, hiking, horseback riding, paddling, fishing, picnicking, and cave tours. Uh, the mission of Mammoth Cave National Park is to protect and preserve for the future the extensive limestone caverns and associated karst topography, the scenic riverways, original forests and other biological resources, and evidence of past and contemporary lifeways. The park's goal is to provide for the public education and enrichment through scientific study and to provide for development and sustainable use of recreation resources and opportunities. Now, humanity has been making its mark on Mammoth Cave for over 5,000 years. People have been in pursuit of natural resources, quests of self-discovery, research to better understand the cave and our place in it, and explore the cave's many passages. These experiences have all led to those cultural features and artifacts we see in the karst system today. Now, Mammoth Cave was designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1981, and this uh, designation was established under a criteria relating to natural history, not culture history. But however, um, based on the newly reorganized criteria that was established in 2004, Mammoth Cave National Park is now listed under natural criteria 7, 8, and 10. And so I've listed those there for you just to get a general idea um, the cave is basically noted for its extreme size, as well as the superlative examples of cave formation and natural features, the over 100 million years of geologic development processes, and over 12 mil million years of cave formation processes. And then the flora and fauna of the cave, that is the richest, richest example of caverniculous wildlife known. Um, there's some uh, 130 species or more that have been identified in the cave. And this includes uh, species of troglobites and troglophiles that are only known to exist within Mammoth Cave. So it's, it's quite obvious that the, uh, the, the natural resources are, are certainly justified in their significance as a, UNESCO, uh, as a UNESCO resource. However, there are still a lot of unique resources and charismatic players that can further engage and inspire those who come to explore Mammoth Cave's passages, and those are related to the cultural resources. Now, when looking at cultural resources, the landscape is a defining concept in the way the National Park Service identifies and manages those resources within a park. Um, this map shows only the passages of Mammoth Cave from a 1991 historic district determination. Um, which basically described those parts of the cave that were considered significant for, for cultural resources. So this first image here, what we're looking at is just a small section of the cave and some of those segments of the passageway, starting at your historic entrance. And the, uh, the red highlighted areas are ones that are considered contributing segments. And then there's a non-contributing set of segments. So it basically interconnects all of the uh, historic district areas uh, to one another. Now this was all defined in 1991. But over the last 29 years, our knowledge of the cave has continued to grow and our understanding of its history along with it. So now the National Park Service uh, views the cave system as a cultural landscape to be managed but not only in terms of those passageways that have been traveled time and again throughout history, but have also risen to a level of historical significance for the activities that occurred there. So now we're looking here at a, a full map of 
the main passageways um, within Mammoth Cave. And so you'll see the whole network of passages. Again, here is our historic entrance. And where that first image I showed you was, it was running from here down to our Violet City Carmichael entrance. So this was that first image, was just right through this area. And now we've extended this through a research study on the cultural landscape to include all of these red highlighted passages. So we'll be looking um, at the cave in terms of both its prehistoric resources, but also its historic resources. And so in the discussions dealing with prehistory, most of our uh, areas of discussion will be actually in that original passageway sections that we were, we were first talking about. Um, later, early historic activity occurred primarily around the historic entrance of the cave and in some of these passages that interconnect through there. In the later 20th century, it extends down into areas near the Violet City entrance and further into the cave. And then through the early 1920s and into the, uh, the current era, the cave passage became very, very much more uh, explored and, and identified. And through that, we see the current area that's defined now as, as part of that um, history of exploration. And so that's where the, the passageways that we now define as the historic district are, are being developed. So to get into the prehistoric use of Mammoth Cave, um, as I was just discussing with that last map image, we have over 35 miles of passageways that extend through a network uh, of the cave. And this is for prehistoric exploration and use of the cave that we see some of this activity occurring. Beginning at the main entrance to the cave, the one we refer to as the historic entrance, we know that prehistoric people were traveling nearly four miles into the cave and performing activities that were related to exploration, resource extraction, that is mining, and ritual practices. The archaeology of the cave gives us a well-preserved collection of materials that archaeologists have studied to develop theories behind what the activities meant to the people that were performing them. Exploration of Mammoth Cave appears to begin at least 5,000 years ago, and this is based on radiocarbon analysis of materials that were collected from the cave since the late 1960s. This would mean that archaic period hunter-gatherers were the first people to enter into Mammoth Cave and explore its passageways. These people were certainly curious about what was lying within the gigantic dark passages, but they were also seeking out opportunities to obtain resources that could not be found elsewhere. And so in terms of, again, the dates that have been defined from uh, radiocarbon um, analyses, we have in the upper passages of Mammoth Cave, such as Audubon Avenue, dates that range from somewhere around uh, 4490 to 4920, in terms of calibrated calendar years ago. And then uh, for the lower passages, um, this would be in an area called Jessup Avenue, we have dates that are just slightly more recent at 4510 to 4900. And so again, it's throughout the entire network of prehistoric passageways that were explored, um, those dates are, are pretty uh, consistent throughout. So people were basically getting into the cave and exploring it to the full extent that they were going to, going to identify things or, or uh, discover things. And, and they were reaching those furthest, uh, furthest extents of the cave from the very beginning, basically. So now prehistoric cavers would have first come to seek shelter in the vestibule or entrance of the cave but would have immediately started to push the limits of travel into the dark zone. As they traveled deeper, they would have discovered branching passages, expansive rooms, intriguing formations, and, and dynamic water flows entering these areas. They would eventually find mineral deposits on the cave walls and in the soils of the cave, and these had several uses. By the early woodland period, so this is about 3,000 to 2,200 years ago, Sulfate minerals would become a central focus for cave explorers. The early cavers would manage to go with um, nothing but cane reed torches, 
Uh, those are displayed here on the left hand side. You'll see sort of a, a broken bundle of torch material. Um, woven fiber sandals and bags and perhaps a few digging sticks or shells. Now on the right side here, this is actually a gourd vessel, um, a, a broken fragment of a gourd. So it, it was likely used as a vessel or, or some sort of container that they would have used in the cave. The minerals they were after would have been long understood by prehistoric Native Americans for their medicinal benefits. They also could have used them as a white pigment for body paint or burial adornment. Because of their high level of solvency, these minerals do not preserve in the archaeological record outside of the cave. Intensive mining of three minerals seems to have accelerated in the early woodland period. So this would be gypsum, epsomite, and mirabolite. Um, these were extracted from the cave at a much larger scale than it had been in the past um, prior to the woodland period. Outside of the cave, these minerals were quickly, would qu quickly break down as they are highly soluble in the humid air and the wet soils. As a result, we have none of these mi minerals in the archaeological record, and this creates a challenge for directly identifying their use. But we have some good ideas based on medical science and the ethnographic record. So first, let's uh, try to better understand how these minerals form exactly. Now, the dry areas of the cave support the proper conditions for sulfate minerals, uh, gypsum, epsomite, and mirabolite to precipitate on the walls and in the soils of the cave. In the cave, gypsum is ubiquitous and forms in a thick crust and flower-like crystals on the walls. Uh, this includes fibrous mats in crevices where the growth is restricted and tabular or prismatic crystals known as selenite in the sediments where it's saturated with calcium sulfate. So two other sulfate minerals, mirabolite and epsomite, um, a lot of folks know these as glauber salt or epsom salt. Uh, these can be found in the dry passages, but in a low, uh, more limited abundance. Um, these minerals can be easily removed from the cave surfaces and are more sensitive to humidity fluctuations. They'll precip precipitate in delicate fibrous coatings on the cave floor and break down surfaces, then dissolve in the seasonal fluctuations of the cave environment. When consumed, these minerals are an intestinal cathartic, and while di direct evidence for their collection does not exist, the presence of a large number of paleofeces, um, that is ancient poop, exists in the cave and suggests that they were sought after for their medicinal properties. So this activity is also significant and we'll address uh, why that is in just a moment here. In terms of the mining, prehistorically uh, visited passages of Mammoth Cave show extensive battering, scraping, and gouging on the walls. And so this image here provides uh, a view of some of that. This is where the gypsum material, um, in these photos, it's actually kind of blackened from cave smoke and soot, but they've actually been broken off and cracked away, and that's from the mining activity. Um, so ancient excavation pits uh, were also found in the cave soils, and digging, in, yeah, digging sticks indicate that the minerals were also removed from the floor sediments as well. Now, a major survey that was done of the main upper trunk passage of Mammoth Cave was conducted in the late 1990s and early 2000s with the support of the National Park Service and Earthwatch. Earthwatch is an international nonprofit organization that connects citizens with scientists to improve the health and sustainability of the planet. This survey was partially motivated by plans to update cave trails and provide more sustainable walking paths that would mitigate the spread of dust on sensitive archaeological materials, as well as other cave resources. The 12-year study identified over 6,000 prehistoric artifacts and confirmed the location of concentrated prehistoric activity in the upper passages of Mammoth Cave. Patterns identified through the Earthwatch studies revealed that nearly half of all prehistoric artifacts found in the cave were, were located in the snow room. 
Um, and so this area is, is kind of centrally located within that passageway that we were first uh, seeing displayed on the map, the, uh, the prehistorically traveled uh, portions of the cave. Um, and so the snow room is an area that is known to accumulate dense layers of Mirabilite. This suggests that the harvesting of Mirabilite and Epsomite was just as significant to cave explorers as the gypsum mining activity, perhaps even more so. Um, the concentration of artifacts, including gourd containers, mussel shell scrapers, torch ties, and woven fiber slippers, um, like the one displayed here in the upper right. Uh, this suggests that people were spending more time in this area than almost any other location in Mammoth Cave. And so on the, uh, the lower right here, we were mentioning the paleo feces. That's, that's an example of that there. And then the, uh, the piles of Mirabilite you can see here are, are built up on the, uh, the surfaces of the cave floor in this photo. And again, this, this uh, material will actually accumulate and then um, dissipate seasonally. We know that prehistoric cavers traveled in Mammoth's Cave's lower passages of, as well. Ganter Avenue is located under the upper main cave level and travels through a series of more narrow passages where concentrated gypsum mining occurred in certain areas. When followed further, Ganter Avenue descends into a wet passage that contains many exposures of chert nodules within the St. Genevieve limestone. This passageway is called Flint Alley. Uh, again, a great deal of bashing and broken material suggests that chert was mined but not to the same level as sulfates found in the main passage. So this wasn't uh, utilized to, to that kind of scale, but it still definitely was accessed. So some of the earliest radiocarbon dates from Mammoth Cave have been collected in these deep passages. Um, those dates I was mentioning earlier include ones that come from here. Uh, this seems to suggest that early cavers were exploring well into the cave but then later, the mining uh, of sulfate minerals became the most focused activity. Now in historic times, uh, there was discoveries made. Um, exiccated bodies had been found in several of the caves in the region. Um, few had been reported with accurate detail, but one was identified in Mammoth Cave in 1935. An approximately 45-year-old male was discovered, having been crushed by a limestone block that had been undermined while the individual was apparently digging in the sediment. The body was recovered, constructing a temporary scaffolding and rigging cables to lift the rock. And that's basically what you see here in the cave today, is the rock that the discovery was made underneath and the, uh, the cables from 1935 that are still in place from when they uh, built this scaffolding and, and lifted it. Forensic studies determined that death would have been nearly immediate for this uh, unfortunate individual. A second individual was discovered in 1875. A young boy of approximately nine years of age was found in a passage of Salts Cave. Now, Salts Cave is within Mammoth Cave National Park and it's located um, Near the, near the boundary of the park. The individual was found in a, lying in a fetal position and there was evidence of hemorrhaging behind his sternum, suggesting that he had experienced a significant trauma and likely died from uh, hypothermia that followed. Burials, unlike the exiccated bodies, have been more typically found in the vestibules of the caves, uh, the, the cave openings, rather than far into its passages. This includes evidence for burials that would have been in the vestibule of historic entrance of Mammoth Cave. While some have been complete, most have been identified as isolated fragmentary human elements and the records of these remains has been unreliable many times. The most accurate documentation that we do have for um, human remains in, in Mammoth Cave National Park is from these two individuals I just mentioned here.
Now, Dr. Carruthers has developed uh, uh, some research behind the use of Mammoth Cave as a ritual landscape used in rites of passages by Native American males. Uh, protein analysis of paleofeces has indicated that cave exploration and mining was most likely an, an exclusively male activity. There are ethnographic examples of liminal phases where childhood is ritually stripped from a youth and through a process of seclusion and isolation, they are reinitiated as an adult member of the community. Mammoth Cave offers evidence of these activities through the archeology, span the ritual process of an ordeal that could be um, experienced when caves, cavers use epsomite as a purgative um, they seclude themselves into the dark remote settings of the cave and then seek out gypsum as a symbolic resource. Um, this could all be used to signify a passage into adulthood. Then in combination, it's easy to see how these activities could have been part of a, a broader ritual process. Um, and this might induce some abstract and representational art that we see in the cave today. And so here on the, uh, the right side, we see a, uh, what we refer to as a corn husk figure. And then below that is a very standard kind of geometric pattern we refer to as cross hatching or grid pattern. This is actually historic um, way marking that was put in right next to the, uh, to the cave art, but this is prehistoric. And then this spiral pattern is a very um, common theme that's seen in a lot of cave art. Again, here's some additional cross hatching or um, possible chevrons that are being drawn. So rock art within Mammoth Cave can vary dramatically across time, but certain consistent themes continue to appear. Uh, these images are found as either pecked or etched petroglyphs and marked charcoal pictographs. Um, simple geometric designs are the most typical. So these are grids, zigzags, curved and parallel lines, dots, spirals, concentric arcs, circles, and rays emanating from a central point or arc. The art depicted at Standing Rocks, shown here, is located near uh, the acute angle in the main cave passage and shows some, ex uh, some interesting examples of this type of geometric artwork. However, there are also uh, human forms and animal forms that are um, less frequently used in the cave, but are seen in, in several places. Um, these are often some of the most intriguing forms of art, and, and there are many theories that people have developed behind what they could mean, but ultimately, um, you know, like many things in art, we don't have a, a direct explanation for it. And so um, things like the ritual use theory posed by Dr. Crothers is a, is a very good um, assessment of what these could be part of. Um, and so here you see this human-like figure that's standing in the center. And there are actually others that are kind of a little more difficult to see, but are also a part of this, this very busy panel that's within Mammoth Cave. Um, compared to the extensive mining on the cave walls, there is a limited amount of cave art suggesting it was not the intended focus of cave activity. This art may have been inspired by the effects of the ordeal that was experienced by cavers. In reaching certain altered states of consciousness, an individual could find an outlet for their perceived experience through art. Um, what is known as entoptic phenomena is induced by long periods of darkness and silence and could have inspired this imagery. Um, this is perhaps uh, in relation to perceived visions or perceived sounds that could have been coming from uh, within the cave while, while people were experiencing that environment. Um, there's also evidence from the paleofeces found in the cave that there may have been consumed stimulants or hallucinogens used to reach altered states of consciousness. So again, the, uh, the ethnographic record provides examples to support these ideas and cultures across the globe have consistently used caves for ritual activities. So here we see um, a, a very well-known panel. This is called the Devil's Looking Glass. And on this panel in the lower portion, there's this uh, very interesting human, 
human-like anthropomorphic figure. Um, also some other imagery some have, some have considered this to be lightning or perhaps water. Um, it's again, hard to, hard to know for certain. And then another image um, from kind of closer to the historic entrance is this figure here. And this is probably representational of a horned headdress that would have been on this, uh, this little human-like human figure here. So some very interesting artwork that comes out of the cave. So now let's look at the, uh, the historic period of Mammoth Cave. And this began at the start of the 19th century and continued up until the establishment of the National Park. During the historic period, the cave became the scene of multiple events in exploration, industry, medical studies, and commercial tourism. These activities resulted in many of the features we find on some of the most popular tour routes. Um, the cave was discovered by Euro-American settlers around 1798. Uh, an old folktale claims that John Houchin was an early settler and stumbled upon the cave entrance when he was chasing a bear that he shot at and it ran into the cave. Um, as an early industry of the Kentucky Territory, saltpeter mining was a driving force behind some of the earliest American settlers in this part of the uh, United States. So gunpowder is made um, by combining potassium nitrate, which is basically saltpeter, and, and that's, that's combined with sulfur and wood charcoal to make, um, make gunpowder. Now the development of saltpeter mining at Mammoth Cave occurred sometime around 1800. The first record of Mammoth Cave appears in a land certificate dated September 4th, 1798. And then early saltpeter mining, um, it would have been limited, but by 1811, owners of the cave were doing enough mining here that they started to actually record and map the, uh, the passages of the cave to try to, to document the work that they were doing. Now the eye draw map of Mammoth Cave is, uh, is displayed here. And th again, this is from 1811. So this is the first known map and this depicts the entrance of the cave and the earliest saltpeter leaching vats. And so um, you'll see here it shows the, uh, the entrance to the cave here. And then the, uh, the vats would have been marked down in this area. Oh, excuse me, here, here's our entrance, sorry about that. And so yeah, the, the vats were marked right down in this area. By the War of 1812, uh, Mammoth Cave became a fully operating early industrial mining site. The saltpeter works were expanded to areas farther within the cave to allow for more efficient mining um, directly in contact with the sediments they were getting after and, and to help improve the uh, hauling of sediments. Two areas of leaching vats were developed at this time, one in the rotunda room, which is displayed here, and then um, another one at a, a location called Booth's Amphitheater, which is about 1,500 feet into the cave. These areas would have been among the most active for mining and processing cave sediment with 20 to 30 miners digging in one area and hauling and stirring vats um, while they were doing that work. It should be noted that most of the miners at Mammoth Cave were slaves during this time. During the War of 1812, an account tells that there were 70 slaves working in the cave. And in in preparing an area for digging, miners would remove the floor breakdown rock and stack it into walls. And these walls actually continue to exist inside of Mammoth Cave today. Um, three nearly intact leaching vats and the remnants of a pump tower remain in the rotunda. This is the first large room that visitors will come to um, through the winding entry passageway called the Houchins Narrows. The leaching vats in the rotunda are thought to have been capable of processing approximately 10 tons of peter dirt at one time. The leaching process could take three days to allow the soils to be sufficiently saturated and allow the beer, as they called it, to reach its full potency for processing. At the height of operation in 1814, as much as 115,000 pounds of saltpeter was manufactured for gunpowder plants on the East Coast. 
Um, many folks have heard of the DuPont Company. Well, the, um, the DuPont Company of Philadelphia was actually the primary manufacturer that was being supplied by Mammoth Cave. And here we have uh, another image of one of the vats here at uh, uh, the Rotunda Room. This is, again, the, um, we're, we're talking about the area closest to the historic entrance. So we're not too far into the cave here. But this shows um, sort of some of the design of these vats and how they function. So they'd be filled with this peter dirt and water would be just sort of passively poured in continuously and it would drain through much, much like your own coffee filter would work. The, uh, the, the nitre beer would come down through the vats and pour out on these logs that would come into the trough and then the pipe and pumping system would pull that water up and carry it out of the cave to be processed by furnaces that were at the exterior of the cave. Now Booth Amphitheater is the location of the second group of leaching vats. And again, this is located about 1500 feet from the entrance. Um, this area contains the remains of seven vats and five of those are still in pretty recognizable condition. Now what's interesting about these um, is that this second large section of vats was constructed with uh, some upgraded mechanics, if you will. Um, the vats in the rotunda, as I said, leached soils sort of in a passive method with continuous flowing water, but this second vat were actually designed with a stopper inside of the casing of the wall of the vat. So if we look here, we can see that this um, stopper was something that they designed to put in and you could just lower it, prevent the water from flowing out, and then allow it to sit and sort of uh, let the beer steep for a while and accumulate as much of the, the, um, the nitre as possible. And then it could be released and allow that water to then flow out freely. So again, they were constantly working to improve these, these uh, saltpeter works as they were building them. A major challenge for the mine workers was hauling the soils and processed niter from the cave. A trail of, uh, for oxen and carts was used to carry material from the entrance uh, to the digging sites uh, and then to the leaching vats. So the ox cart trail would eventually run from the entrance to a location just beyond Booth's amphitheater and this was called uh, Wandering Willie Spring. And, and so they could hold the oxen there in the cave and actually keep them overnight, it's just stable them within the cave um, itself. And so we have a view here showing the um, ox cart path as you'd see it today. Here's our modern paver trail for tours. Um, and so for a time, this was actually covered up and then it was recognized what the uh, the hardened surface was the result of was, was the result of this ox cart trail and so we were able to pull back the uh, the stones that were covering it and people can actually see it today. Now the uh, ability to carry water to the mining pits, oops, excuse me, the ability to carry the water to the mining pits and vats was important for the efficiency of the mine works. Um, a gravity-fed piping system was developed that could carry water from the cave entrance all the way to the Booth's amphitheater. Two parallel pipelines traveled from a trough that collected water at the entrance to the waterfall. Um, and then uh, the incoming water would flow into the rotunda's vats or continue to the vats at Booth's amphitheater following a steady down cave slope. The challenge came when trying to get the leach water pumped out. The, the pumps were uh, a pretty sophisticated piece of technology and um, pumping was still uh, um, something that wasn't used very widely in, uh, in technology, except for in situations like seafaring or mining applications. And so um, this is a very good example here of the, uh, the pump that was used in one of the towers and it offers kind of a, a good example of how this would have functioned. So you have the lever here and uh, an individual would be on top of the pump tower and just operate that up and down. 
and then this rod would actually create a, a suction with this, this leather in place here inside of the pump. And so that could pull water up, up to 20 to 40 feet just by human power. So it was a, a pretty impressive piece of um, equipment that was obviously probably designed and developed by people out east and then perhaps even shipped to the cave uh, to be used. Now tourism within Mammoth Cave began almost immediately following the abandonment of saltpeter mining manufacturing at Mammoth Cave. Um, the end of the War of 1812 would result in the saltpeter market crashing and so many uh, cave miners and, and um, managers would be looking for new work. Um, some of the earliest guides of the cave were actually previously part of the saltpeter operations and in, uh, important contributors to the early success of the cave as a tourist attraction. In the 1820s and 30s, traveling to Kentucky was still a significant undertaking um, from the population centers in the east. Riding a stagecoach over unreliable roads and limited lodgings made for a challenging trip. So miners were, um, the miners lodgings near the entrance to the cave were actually developed as part of the, uh, the new hotel that would be used at Mammoth Cave. And so here's just some other examples of areas that were significant in the early tourism of the cave. We have some early stone steps that were constructed. This is off of the Gothic Avenue. And then a, a very well-known location for early tourists and contemporary tourists alike is the Fat Man's Misery. So this is a, a, a very narrow, um, naturally eroded cut inside of the cave that you have to walk through. And so these are just good examples of locations that were named during this early um, tourism period. And many of the names in the cave are from this period. We have uh, names like the Bridal Altar, Jenny Lynn's Armchair, the Bottomless Pit. These are all names that you would have heard when you were part of the tours going on in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. Now Gothic Avenue is a, uh, a famous passage for its smooth limestone ceiling and 19th century signatures left during the early tourist trade. These candle smoke signatures are from soot applied by holding a candle to the cave ceiling. Some signatures are from the 1812 era, but most were added in the 1830s, 40s, and 50s. Um, today they are considered a significant cultural resource with signatures of well-known individuals in politics and culture from this time. However, in Mammoth Cave, few are more uh, well-recognized than Stephen Bishop, and his name is also found here on the ceiling of Gothic Avenue. Um, a lot of folks believe that this might actually be a drawn bust of Stephen Bishop. And I'm gonna get into just who he is in just a moment. Um, monument construction was actually another very popular thing occurring in the 19th century. And so this is the Kentucky Monument in Mammoth Cave, uh, or in Gothic Avenue, excuse me. So now, who is Stephen Bishop? Well, Bishop was a 17-year-old black slave when he was brought to Mammoth Cave. He was brought here by Franklin Gorin, a lawyer and short-term owner of the cave in 1838. By 1839, Dr. John Cron, a physician from Louisville, Kentucky, had purchased the cave and the rights to Stephen as a, a slave and guide inside of the cave. But as an explorer, Stephen Bishop would prove to be unique among his cave guide counterparts. Historical accounts from Gorin and later witnesses say that in 1838, Stephen Bishop traveled to uh, one extent of the explored cave passages he set a wooden ladder across a, a barrier called the bottomless pit and crossed this obstacle with a lantern in his teeth. He was the first person to cross this barrier and explore cave passages that would lead to the lower levels of the cave. By 1839, he had discovered the submerged passages called Echo River and Roaring River and eventually identified eyeless fish living in their waters. In 1840, he found what would later be considered his greatest discovery, the 192-foot-high Mammoth Dome. 
And so off to the right here, you'll see this is an image of Mammoth Dome. Obviously, Stephen didn't have the advantage of climbing the, uh, the stairs to get up and down it, but he had discovered it from up above. And so later on, when the cave uh, was developed further with the National Park Service, a uh, stairwell was put in. And then down below, you'll see an image here of the bottomless pit. That's the one that he crossed. So Bishop was so greatly trusted for his knowledge of the cave that in 1842, he was sent to uh, Locust Grove. This was Dr. Cron's estate in Louisville. And for two weeks, he drew a map of the cave system, all from memory. The map covered 10 miles of cave passage, of which half had been discovered by Stephen himself. The map was later published in an account of, uh, that was titled Rambles in Mammoth Cave. And this was written by Alexander Clark Bullock. And Bishop was actually given full credit of, of the work that he did. And this is pretty unique for that time period and, and for Stephen being an African American. And so that in itself is fairly significant. Um, the map was considered an accurate navigation resource for over 40 years. Now, Stephen's uh, discoveries continued until his freedom was granted in 1856. Dr. Cron had died in 1849, and his will would free Stephen and his family seven years after his passing. Stephen may have been planning to emigrate to Liberia. Uh, this was a well-known colony for freed slaves in the 19th century. However, in the antebellum South, this could have also been a very non-threatening way he could tell uh, folks, you know, stories of what he was planning to do. Um, however, in any case, he remained on the Edmondson County uh, land and eventually purchased 80 acres of land on the Flint Ridge. Uh, this was just a couple of miles from the cave. Then after only a year of freedom, Stephen Bishop uh, suddenly passed away. Uh, we don't know why or, or how. Um, and while his life did matter greatly to Mammoth Cave history, he, he obviously faced many challenges that surely made life after slavery a challenging one. So now he's buried um, in the Old Guide Cemetery that sits atop Mammoth Cave Ridge and overlooks the historic entrance to the cave. So I mentioned Dr. Cron. Uh, Dr. Dr. John Cron was actually um, the owner of the cave during most of Stephen Bishop's time working there and, and during most of his discoveries. Um, he became the owner in 1839 and he was a, uh, a physician that intended to prove that the cave environment was capable of healing respiratory illness, specifically com consumption, what we would know as tuberculosis today. He, was, he, he convinced 16 patients to endure a long-term experiment in the winter of 1842 and 43, and he sent slaves down into the cave to construct small structures and housing for these patients. Two were made from dry laid stone. Um, one of these is thought to be Dr. Cron's office. The one on the bottom right here is that one. Um, eight were constructed of lumber. Uh, these are all kind of fallen apart and, and are no longer uh, visible on the cave floor today. These buildings would function as a sanatorium and the, uh, the two stone huts do remain standing. Ultimately, the experiment would end in failure and five patients would pass away underground. Um, three of these individuals would be buried in the Old Guide Cemetery near the entrance to the cave. Dr. Cron himself would eventually struggle against tuberculosis and he passed away in 1849. His will would grant ownership of the cave to his seven nieces and nephews, the Cron heirs, and Mammoth Cave would remain in the Cron family as the Mammoth, Mammoth Cave estate until the 1920s. So while the, uh, the fate of Dr. Cron and his experiment is rather unfortunate, um, his greatest legacy was actually the choice to have the cave held in this trust. This would preserve the cave as a nearly singular property until the early 1920s when talk of a national park was even a possibility. So now as the 20th century started to unfold, scientists and researchers became more interested in the cave. Max 
Harper was one of these bright minds arriving at Mammoth Cave for a short visit in 1908. Well, as a, uh, a German engineer and uh, an artillery officer and a map maker, he became enamored by the cave's great passages and he was determined to discover where new passages were and to create a comprehensive map. With uh, cave guide Ed Bishop, uh, incidentally, Ed Bishop was probably a, uh, a removed cousin from uh, Stephen Bishop, quite possibly. Um, but Kemper mapped and surveyed miles of passageway. They, they mapped significant advances or they made significant advances in cave exploration and even discovered three of the largest rooms in the main cave passages beyond Ultima Thule. Um, this was thought to be actually the end of the cave at one time. So uh, let's see, it's located right down in this area was a spot called Ultima Thule. And in fact, he was able to extend it onward and find three additional passages which then led us to getting to the Violet City entrance that we now have today. Um, starting in the late 1800s and reaching a peak in the 1920s, intense competition had developed for commercial tours in the area around Mammoth Cave. So the Mammoth Cave estate, like I had mentioned, had formed in the 19th century after Dr. Cron's death. Then, the, uh, the Louisville and Nashville Railroad would start to develop a business relationship with Mammoth Cave and offered touring rates on their lines and had expanded the advertisements for Mammoth Cave. By the 1920s, Mammoth Cave was now a century old tourist attraction and had proven its profitability. Local farmsteaders would see in the cave of the, see in all the caves of the region an opportunity to raise themselves up from a poverty stricken existence. Exploration for new caves and new entrances in Mammoth Cave system would increase dramatically. New cave owners would seek an opportunity to capitalize on Mammoth Cave's popularity and seven caves in just the Mammoth Cave Ridge and Flint Ridge would have commercial operations at this time. All of these operations would attempt to lure the attention of passing motorists bound for the world famous Mammoth Cave. And so here you'll even see, this is an advertisement that was put up by the Mammoth Cave estates, cautioning tourists, you know, quote unquote, cautioning them, be wary, you, you may not be heading to the right location you're looking for. If you're looking for Mammoth Cave, head this way. So there was, a, there was intense competition going on to try to get people to, uh, to get to your tourist attraction. Uh, uh, an individual who was very famous and, and would kind of go down in history from this period and, and as a part of this kind of commercial enterprising was Floyd Collins. Uh, Collins was a renowned cave explorer and had discovered the Crystal Cave. This was a beautiful cave full of gleaming gypsum passages and unique delicate formations. Now, the only disadvantage to Crystal Cave was that it was very far from many of the travel routes that people were entering into the area. So while exploring for additional opportunities, Stephen Bishop was in Sand Cave on the Flint Ridge. Uh, while he was doing exploration in this cave, his leg became stuck under a rock in a tight crawlway and he could not free himself. So his family discovered him stuck and uh, the next day, and a rescue effort then began that would draw cave and mining experts, government officials, the National Guard, and profiteers and the captivated public. So it became a nationwide news story that was broadcast across radio and radio was really in its infancy at this time. So it was really uh, a mass media phenomena that had really never been experienced before. And so the, the nation was really kind of caught up in daily updates as to what was occurring with Floyd Collins as this rescue effort went on. Sadly, the story would end in tragedy with Floyd's death some two weeks after getting stuck. The story would lead to folk tales, country songs, and poetry. And then in the late 1990s, a musical theater performance was even developed of his infamous tale. Uh, it was shown off of Broadway and in three US cities as well as in London.
Now, some of the biggest competition and greatest influence on the 20th century developments in Mammoth Cave came from George Morrison. Morrison was a Texan and he originally came to the area in 1915 as an oil prospector. After seeing the caves, he immediately shifted focus to cave exploration and commercial cave business. He came into direct legal conflict with the Mammoth Cave estate and its uh, Louisville and Nashville railroad backers. He was directed by court order to remain off of the estate property on the surface and in the cave. So after a, a series of failed exploration attempts, Morrison doubled his efforts by getting financial support to organize the Mammoth Cave Development Company. He finally hit his big break and discovered what would be called the new entrance to Mammoth Cave in around 1920. As one comes through the new entrance, you descend into the King Solomon's Temple, and that's actually pictured here with Morrison in 1922. Um, then you're led down into the Grand Central Station. Grand Central is part of a recent cave development project that has rehabilitated some of the most significant stuff discoveries by George Morrison. So off to the right here, you'll see these are uh, new benches and new pavers that have been put in place to um, provide improved access for our tours in Mammoth Cave in this area called uh, Grand Central Station. And so um, these are actually new infrastructure that is yet to be used by a tour as we speak. So we're, we're anticipating having that uh, open to people in the very near future. Areas accessed by the new entrance include some of the most dramatic view sheds and visually stunning formations known within Mammoth Cave. There are several expansive rooms that offer captivating views of large domed spaces and dramatic breakdown. Morrison would prove to be a worthy competitor to the Mammoth Cave estate, building a hotel on the surface and spending over $250,000 on developments around the new entrance in the 1920s and 30s. But this would all prove fruitless with the growing desire from a for a national park to form. And by the start of 1932, Morrison would be forced to sell his new entrance and the hotel. So the cave wars ultimately came to an end with the founding of the national park. And so um, again, these are two pretty interesting locations within Mammoth Cave. The, uh, the frozen Niagara is a very, very large, very pretty formation. Um, you can actually descend down below it and see an area called the Drapery Room, which is also a pretty impressive space. And this would have all been part of George Morrison's 1920s era uh, tour that was uh, competing with the Mammoth Cave Estate. And then Arrow Bridge um, is one of my particular favorites. It's, it's got this very interesting slope. It's got constructed walls to sort of support the, uh, the trail base. And then up at the very top, if you see this thin line running across the top there, that's actually a steel cable that runs across the full extent of that large room. Say it's about 80 feet long. And it was used as a, a tram system. It held a, a cart that would actually haul material across this very big opening, you know, because at one time it didn't have that trail. So Morrison was actually hauling materials across on this line. And uh, in the 1940s, right, right as the park was starting to form, there is stories that people were actually getting an opportunity to ride across. On I'm not sure that that actually happened, but uh, I know I wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> so in the 1930s, um, there was an era of mass development of the cave for the future park. The US economy was in the midst of the Great Depression and the Civil, Civilian Conservation Corps was a bureau that was developed to put young men to work on public lands. There were four CCC camps that would work between 1933 and 1942 at Mammoth Cave. So now the, uh, the dry laid stone walls, just like the ones I showed you there on Arrow Bridge, these are found in many parts of the cave and are iconic work completed by the CCC. So we find a lot of these um, near project areas that we work on today, and we're doing our best to try to maintain and preserve those. Um, they would also renovate areas like the frozen Niagara entrance. Um, this is showing here 
gentleman working in, in, I believe, 1940, working to open up that entryway and to provide a nice trail for it. And this is a view of it as we see it today. Um, they built seven miles of surface trails in the park, as well as 61 miles of truck routes. They improved the telephone system, constructed seven miles of sewage line, planted close to a million trees, um, and then they also raised or, or destroyed over 12, uh, 2,000 2, farm buildings, excuse me, um, which is kind of a sad reality for the park because that was a lot of historic uh, structures that were lost. But the rationale at the time was that we were looking to create a natural setting inside of the national park. And so um, that just ties to the history of this area. Um, and then most significantly for the cave and what we see in there today, there were 24 miles of cave trails that were constructed by the CCC. Now in the mid 20th century, this was sort of the last major development period up to the current period now. Um, and beginning in 1956, there was a, an effort for 10 years called the Mission 66 program and this occurred across nearly all national parks in the US and resulted in many of the visitor centers, campgrounds and modern accommodations that we recognize as typical of US national parks today. Within the cave, uh, developments like an elevator shaft, cave plumbing systems and the snowball dining room, uh, these were all Mission 66 developments that occurred. Um, so seeing, looking up here, you've got a, this is actually a lunch counter that's inside of uh, Mammoth Cave. This is called the Snowball Dining Room. And um, for anyone like myself who grew up getting to take trips to Mammoth Cave, one of the most unique experiences that you would get is being able to go down the elevator underground and have lunch inside of Mammoth Cave. Um, while we all as kids thought this was a, a, a neat thing and an exciting thing, it wasn't until later that it was recognized that this actually had some pretty uh, negative effects on the ecology of the cave. And so um, wiser heads prevailed into the future here. And while the infrastructure remains, um, the lunches do not inside of Mammoth Cave. So the, uh, Excuse me. There are more contemporary materials in the cave um, that many of us have come to recognize as part of the Mammoth Cave experience. And some of this infrastructure still remains and tells the story of the 20th century and its development periods during, uh, during National Park Service management. Now the cultural resources of Mammoth Cave, they continue to be cared for and created today. A new era of projects to improve visitor access to over 15 miles of cave tour routes has begun, but not without serious attention to the historic properties and natural features of the cave. Laws that include the National Historic Preservation Act, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, um, these all assist park managers in making good decisions that will ensure the enduring stories of significant persons, events, unique features and research data stores from within the cave. And these will all be available for future generations to experience and learn from. Um, one last closing note is this is kind of a demonstration of some of the new things that are being uncovered with the work that we do to manage the cave. This was actually a uh, one of three wooden artifacts that were discovered in the lower submerged passages of the cave um, during a stream sediment um, project that was being done. And so we're actually right now getting some uh, radiometric dating done on these materials. And it, it looks to be that they're about um, 300 years in age for the wood. However, the wood does have some historic nails in it. So we're still trying to kind of track in how old we think this material is, but it looks to be from the early historic period of Mammoth Cave. And that's fairly interesting because um, we don't really know a whole lot as to what these lower passages were used for um, during the earliest periods of, of historic use. So this is hopefully going to be new information that is going to help us to tell this story a little bit more clearly. And, uh, and the work continues at Mammoth Cave. So 
that's all I have for you folks. Um, and certainly uh, I'm available to answer questions and absolutely George is available to, to answer questions regarding the archeology span and the history of the cave. And we, uh, we both thank you for your time. Thanks, Ed. I've got a couple got questions couple that came up that you could probably, you could probably answer, answer better. better. I will um, do my best. One was, it was asked it was whether asked, uh, uh, the cultural landscape study, does it extend beyond Mammoth Cave, the Mammoth Cave Ridge? Does it include other caves in the park? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so with cultural landscapes, uh, we don't take it at the full um, extent of the park. We actually have multiple landscapes defined within Mammoth Cave National Park. Um, one landscape study that has been done was actually for the surface of, of the park right within its, um, what we call the core visitor services area. So this part of the park is where the hotel and the visitor center and some of the earliest sort of historic developments were done around the entryway to the cave. So that's just one example of a cultural landscape study that was done. Um, the next one in line now is the one we're working on, which is for within the cave itself. But um, certainly there are going to be future studies that we're already planning to, uh, to get implemented. And those will relate to other caves and other areas that had development around those caves. Um, I had mentioned uh, Floyd Collins Crystal Cave. That's one example. We will definitely get a, a, a landscape study done for that one as well. I would think Salt's Cave would be another good, good candidate. Absolutely, yeah. The, uh, the archaeology of Salt's Cave is, is premier for the National Park and, and really for cave archaeology here in the eastern United States and eastern North America. Um, so certainly getting a cultural landscape study done for that cave would be uh, a top priority as well. One other question and I'll open it up to anyone else who wants to ask. Um, I think you mentioned to me that you were talking about maybe date, dating some of the, some of the uh, charcoal pictographs. Is that correct? Was the Tennessee Cavers talking about that? Um, so that is... Uh, a, a goal that we would have, you know, I think for the cave right now, we have somewhere in the range of, of 60 to 70 dates that have been uh, acquired. And we would like to expand that to, to more, um, more of the, uh, the rock art, finding dates related to those, as well as just other areas of the cave where we haven't collected a lot of dates up to this point. So um, that's certainly a, an objective but we don't have any, any good dating done yet for any of the cave art that I'm aware of. Yeah, we discussed that in the past. And one thing that kind of always stopped us from doing it, first, they've improved it now, so you don't need as much charcoal, but when you needed more charcoal, we didn't want to destroy the, petroglyph the pictographs. Um, but the trouble is there's so much charcoal, there's so much ancient charcoal in the cave that, that you or I could go in the cave and draw a drawing with that, with that wood and someone else could come in radiocarbon data and it would say it's, you know, two or 3000 years old. But, um, so you, you'll never completely, uh, satisfy the doubters that, yeah, the drawing's really two or 3000 years old. Yeah, there is, there is certainly uh, challenges like that to face. Um, you know, that's sort of the double edged sword of having such excellent preservation in the cave. You know, I've, I've mentioned this and certainly George and, and others have, have pointed this out, you know, in, uh, in cave archaeology, you have all of your material, no matter the age, it's all kind of right within reach of one another. There is no development of deposition, you know, so to speak. You have just all of your materials kind of preserved in, in one, one surface. There is no stratigraphy. Um, so that, that does raise some challenges to getting good, accurate dating done. Okay, if anyone else has any questions, you can type them in or you can, I think you can unmute yourself if you want to ask a question. 
Um, yeah, I've got a, a question related to what you were just saying. I think I know the answer, but still, um, yesterday, you know, someone was saying um, and introducing the cave about how far back uh, Native Americans went in during prehistoric time. And then uh, today you were talking about, and it's a great presentation, by the way, um, uh, you were talking about how uh, work in the lower levels, mining chert, came before uh, mining the evaporite minerals. So that makes me wonder, um, do you have enough resolution in radiocarbon dates to suggest if the cave was explored uh, or exploited in some systematic fashion. I mean, nowadays, you know, the, you know, typically the way we explore caves, I go in, uh, I find what I find, I exploit what I exploit, I give the information to you, then you go further and you give the information to someone else who goes further. Um, so is there any information or the they that just do course? Sorry, what was the last part of that statement? Uh, are the day the two cores to really refine uh, how the cave may have been explored um, in some sort of systematic fashion? Um, yeah, I think, again, I think that's a, a challenge for, for getting um, just additional dates and, and trying to do it in a, um, in a comprehensive way. I think a lot of the dates we're, we're pulling from now are from studies that were done, you know, 30, 40 years ago. And so there really is a, uh, uh, an imperative to get additional research done, you know, in getting, uh, getting dates from, from lower passages, especially just because I don't think we have a good, um, a good handle on how people were progressing into the cave. I think the kind of the understanding at this point is that as soon as they were arriving at the cave about 5,000, 5,500 years ago, they were moving in pretty rapidly and getting to the full extent of where they would ultimately explore. And then it was sort of just a, a, a later on sort of a development in culture that sort of resulted in the, uh, in the utilization of the gypsum material and the, and the mining activity. So I don't think we have any other um, information to really explain the progress of exploration prehistorically. I think it's just sort of, they showed up and very quickly got to those full extents. And then we know, you know, thereafter sort of what activities were going on. I can add a little bit to that. Um, we, we are, our earliest dates from the cave tend to be from the very remotest parts of the passage. Um, and, and they're gonna, those early dates, as Ed mentioned, are like 4,500 to 5,000 years ago. And then there's about a 1,500 year period where they don't, they're probably still going in the cave, maybe exploring some, but the mining doesn't really start until about 3,000 years ago. And when that happens, then the cave um, is filled with, with torch charcoal. So it's a, part of it's a sampling problem as, you, as you're collecting charcoal you're more likely to get a sample of cane, a torch material from the mining period. And it's only in those really remote sections like Flint Alley doesn't really have gypsum. So they didn't, didn't spend a lot of time down there. Um, so an early date comes out of the lower level passages, but we also have Lee Cave in the park. And then there's other caves in the region that have those 4,500 to really 5,500 year ago. Um, so th there's a, there's a problem with getting the exploration, although we know it starts around 5,000 years ago, and the mining starts around 3,000 years ago. And we have done, we played around with, we have enough dates from the cave now that we can actually see the progression of mining. And as you'd expect, um, the mining starts closer to the entrance. And if you, if you uh, do a simple linear regression of distance from the entrance, you can see the older dates do start showing up in the more remote parts of the cave that still have gypsum in it. Um, but, and we've got enough samples now that it's, we can say that with some, some relative act strength in that, in that argument that they did progress mining from closer to the entrance to farther from the entrance. I had one question and um, it's really about the World Heritage Program. <laughs> so, um, 
uh, but with, I was just kind of curious, you know, with this designation, are there any, are there still periodic reviews, say similar to the Biosphere Reserve Program, or is it just you get this designation as long as you keep it, you know, within a protected area, you know, that's all that is, you know, required as far as that interaction with that UNESCO designation? Hmm. Yeah, I, I honestly, I'm not certain on how um, the World Heritage designation is maintained. I know even, even under that categorization, the World Heritage Site designation, Mammoth Cave is um, defined by its natural resources, its natural history. And so um, does that warrant perhaps a, a new look? Um, I personally would say so. I think there is a great deal of, of important, you know, human history and, um, you know, research studies in archaeology that have really redefined our understanding of um, human activity in Eastern North America, particularly with um, domestication of plants. Um, so I think that there is certainly uh, an opportunity there to to add to this designation for uh, for culture history, but as far as its maintenance and what is needed to um, to keep that designation sort of in place, um, I think it is just sort of based on you know justifying it, providing evidence to show that you are maintaining sort of those criteria that have been uh, listed originally. Uh, Ed, I might be able to help on that. Um, just this past weekend, I was uh, I completed an evaluation of Carlsbad Caverns National Park uh, and their world heritage status for the IUCN. Starting in 2014, um, a new program was started to require an evaluation every three years. Um, so evaluations were done um, in some or all, perhaps, of the world heritage sites in 2014, 17, and they're happening uh, right now. Um, in the evaluation that, uh, that I was provided, um, the big emphasis was on management. Uh, what are the threats? Uh, what's being done to protect the resource? Um, and so it wasn't really looking so much at expanding um, uh, the boundaries, although there, was, there were some questions uh, about buffer areas. Um, Around the uh, around the protected area, um, and what's being done, you know, for the community uh, or with the community in partnership to protect the resource. Um, so it wasn't directly looking at expansion, um, but uh, but more at management and protection of the of the site. So uh, I expect uh, that uh, that someone will be contacted if someone already hasn't been contacted uh, to uh, uh, to do an evaluation. Of, uh, of Mammoth. Um, and my first question when I was asked was, can I contact the park? Because you're asking, you know, some of these questions only the park really can answer. <laughs> and they said, yes, yes, no problem. Of course, we want you to contact them. Um, so, uh, so anyway, it's, it's, it's an anonymous evaluation, even though I just admitted to it. Uh, but, um, uh, but anyway, th that might be of some use to you. All right, and, and who was this speaking? I don't see on uh, George Venny. George Venny. I'll turn my camera on. Here we go. No problem. Thank you, George. Yeah. I was just curious. I, I, you know, was actually googling it during some of this, uh, some of the presentation. I was just, you know, because of there's such a rich cultural, um, you know history and uh, resources and I, I just always kind of baffled me as to that designation um, but I mean it makes sense and so I was wondering if there was sort of a management or evaluation process and so that's I know that IUCN has um, been involved in that but thank you for you know outlining that for us. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. I, can I make one announcement? I don't, we're a little late, but we had some Chinese colleagues and I don't want to stop this discussion if people still have questions. Um, but one of our Chinese colleagues um, came in a little bit late and was wanting to do some presentation um, on a new geopark. 
And so they're showing a film about that as following, they just ended the hydro uh, field trip and have started that film if anyone is interested in, in hopping over there and um, viewing that. So just wanted to let everyone know. Thank you. Yeah, when, uh, when Bob Ward was uh, cultural resource manager, we taught, I asked him those questions too. Why wasn't, you know, the designation included cultural heritage when it was nominated? And uh, I don't remember his answer now, but it just, it, I think they just wanted to simplify it at the time. And so they, they didn't really gather the, the, the information they needed to, to get a cultural heritage designation as well as the natural heritage. And it's always something we talked about. It needs to be done, but there was just not the emphasis on uh, the time to do it. Uh, We're, I guess was it geologists that did the application? <laughs> yeah, probably. And <laughs> very, that, those very possible, folks. That's very possible. That's all it came down to. So, yeah, I, I would certainly love to see um, it expanded. I'd love to to be able to to help facilitate that happening. So I think that's certainly a goal for us uh, coming into the future here. At a national level, I mean, both Mammoth Cave is a national historic, uh, is it a landmark now? Is it considered a... Uh, we do not have an NHL uh, National historic site, as well as I think Salts Cave is too. I don't know if there's any other archeological caves in the park that have natural historic, national register status. But I know salts and mammoth do. Yeah, as as far as uh, yeah, National Register of Historic Place listings, the the cave uh, Mammoth Cave has the historic district that was the one that I showed the map of from ninety one, um, and we're now working to expand that. And then Salts Cave has its own designation, and these were part of a multiple property designation that was done all in that nineteen ninety one time frame. So everything we have listed on the register, except for our train, <laughs> is all from that 91 listing. Yeah. Are there any plans or, or, or is there any work right now going uh, outside the park boundaries? Uh, as we're talking about the, the regional, uh, the biosphere reserve man in the biosphere uh, that extends outside the park boundaries. Uh, the, the physical cave extends outside the park boundaries, although there's no evidence that, uh, uh, that ancient people went from one, you know, you know from one uh, cave entrance uh, to the other connecting Mammoth to Roppel or whatever. Um, but is there any work going on outside the boundaries to better unify what's happening within this region? I'm, a, I'm assuming you're meaning culturally. Um, and, and I would say that uh, the, the, the best thing we have going right now, I think what's going to be one of the most helpful resources for our park as a, as a managing body is a ethnographic study that's actually being um, facilitated through um, our, our help from researchers at Western Kentucky University. Um, there's a, an ethnographic overview document that we're getting done right now and this kind of covers um, primarily uh, contemporary um, traditional groups that are, that are affiliated with the park. And so it's defining not only those groups and sort of who those contacts might be, but also defining like research, um, research sources, libraries, museums, just various sorts of uh, data stores of, of ethnographic information that we really haven't fully like synthesized. Um, that's all getting kind of consolidated into the single overview document as we speak and, and we're helping to review that. And so in the near future, I'm, I'm hoping we'll have that and, and it will be available for people to, uh, to look at for research as well. So I, I think that'll be a, a helpful document to inform kind of future management decisions and, and research focus. Great, thank you. Fisher Ridge Cave would be a good addition. I mean, it's it's got prehistoric exploration, pictographs, um, footprints, human footprints. It's a, it's a cave that should, I don't think it's ever been nominated for the National Register, but it could certainly be part of a thematic nomination with the multiple property nomination with mammoth and salts. 
the dates aren't quite as old as mammoth, but it's in that pre mining, pre gypsum mining period. Well, and all the work you guys have done at Crumps, I mean, that's within the biosphere reserve as, yeah. as well. And though we don't have, you know, currently have access, you know, there, there's definitely the, uh, the mud glyphs and those have been dated and stuff. So that would be um, within there too. And Jason, uh, Justin gave an excellent talk on, on his work there yesterday. There, I think it's still landowner land, land, landowner uh, issues, unfortunately. Well, I think the ethnographic studies will have great potential uh, to better inform you about what's what you're finding in the caves, interpreting the pictographs, and so forth. There was uh, uh, some work within the past 20 years uh, in West Texas looking at the Trans Pecos rock art sites, and. Uh, uh, Carolyn Boyd started doing a lot of ethnographic work and it just stunningly tied together uh, the interpretation uh, of the rock art in that area in a way that uh, that made sense like unlike anything previous so uh, uh, so I look forward to seeing those results thank you on that All right, do we have any other questions uh, for our speakers? Well, thanks everyone for uh, showing up. We had some stiff competition over there in the hydrology tour. Quite all right, it's, it's quality, not quantity all the time. <laughs> it was very good. I appreciate it, everybody. I uh, really enjoyed it. Yes, uh, thanks Ed and George for your presentation. Uh, it was really informative and also the question and answer se session was very informative. And thanks to our participants for your questions and, and for your contributions. Um, so I hope you all have a great day. Uh, if you have further questions, don't hesitate to contact Ed and George. I'm sure they'd be happy to answer them. Uh, and Anyone's in the, um, the uh, workshop tomorrow on uh, citizen science too, we'll be talking more about Caver's input into ar identifying archaeological sites. So a plug for that. Very good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Justin. Ed. Where'd my button go? There it is.